welcome to all of you. I am so happy to be with you. I'm Claire out here in Ohio. And a lot of things happen out here in Ohio. And uh, one of these days, you may want a presentation on the land records in Ohio, because Ohio was a hot mess. It's still kind of a hot mess in some ways. So well, what we're going to be talking about today, I actually did this for my own Relief Society. And then it, the word got out to other wards and to the stake, and then it got across the country. And this is one of the most common ones that I give on Memory Keepers. Let me tell you a little bit about some of the people that I, I work with. This is me and my husband on the left, and we are the co-directors of our, our Family Search Center. And the people on the right, well, they are also family history consultants. And sometimes out here, you know, we have all kinds of people that are there to help us. The, the grandmother and the granddaughter, I walked in one day and I saw them there as this grand, granddaughter was helping her grandmother. And I thought, oh, my goodness, this is, this is just full circle with, with this family because my mom's best friend was the grandmother's grandmother. So this is just continuing to go around. And I, I love it. I absolutely love it. I want to talk to you about some of the, the pictures that you may have. Now, if you're like me, you probably have a bunch of them that may be in a drawer or a magnetic folder that you shouldn't have them in. You know, they're... We've, we get overrun with pictures because we're just taking them all the time. My sister recently died. And when I was going up and spending time with her, then I saw some pictures that I didn't know who they were. And some of them. I know who most of them are. And I thought, you know, I'm going to take pictures of these pictures because I just need to do that. So you know where they are? They're in my phone. I never did anything with them. And then one day I went to Kentucky with two of my three sisters and my aunt brought out this big box. It was like the kind you would get a microwave in. And I said, oh, what is that? She goes, well, I know you girls like all this genealogy stuff. So I'm, I'm just going to give you all of this. And it was a box filled with funeral cards and obituaries. And I'm like, who are these people? Well, I just know you like that stuff. And I thought, what am I going to do with them? So I began to scan them or take pictures of the pictures. And I thought, you know, they fell into my lap for a reason. 575 funeral cards and obituaries. So what I have done is I have gone and I have found most of them. I, maybe, I think there's maybe a dozen that I have not found on Family Search. And all I do is just add it to the memories. I don't put any information in or anything. Somewhere, someday, somebody is going to be grateful that they have a funeral card or an obituary for, for their ancestor. They're pro probably going to wonder, well, how did that get up here? And who's Peggy? Well, it doesn't matter. You just, you've got it. You think about all the things that happen all the time. This is February 2021 in Mason County, Texas, another courthouse fire. You look at all of those things that, oh, uh, I mean, at least most of the records had been moved off site uh, several months ago, but they had not been digitized. And so they were asking, is there anybody that would like to help us preserve the records? About a year and a half after my mom died, my dad was making a, a research trip to Kentucky and came back. And the only thing that was standing was the front door and the front wall. Lightning had struck the house, totally burned it. So I went up there to kind of help him go through stuff. And I grabbed a crowbar and right behind the front door, there was, um, there was a, a genealogy cabinet that he had built and it was not destroyed. There was a little bit of smoke damage, a little bit of water damage, but he lost none of his genealogy. We continued on through the house, and there was a seven, seven drawer chest of drawers. The bottom four drawers were burned. The top three 
the varnish had, had sealed shut on it. And I got the crowbar. We opened it up. There was dad's underwear. And he said, you know, Peggy, I've got the clothes I took to Kentucky with me. I've got my genealogy. I've got my underwear. I'm, I'm good. Don't worry about me. I'm going to be fine. We have seen all kinds of devastation all around the world, from flooding and fires to hungry rodents. And I think one of the things that breaks my heart the most is when a family member dies, and it all boils down to, Dad liked me best. We've all seen it. You may have had it in your family. Well, Dad said I could have that. Well, Mom said I could have it. You, I mean, families have been torn apart over this kind of stuff. So these are just a few of the things that can really devastate a family. Because when you hear of destruction, they always ask of people, what, what do you wish you'd gotten? Well, usually it's the pictures. Usually what they say. Well, there's all kinds of things that we can add to our phones. That we can just take scans. You can download these things on, on Google Play or the App Store. Any of those kind of things. And here's an example. This one was done just taking a picture with my camera. And this one was done using an app. I think it was the Google scan thing. So you can see the other one is a little bit darker. But, you know, they're both good. And at least we have them. Ancestry recently had added PhotoMine, which helps you create albums and old photos and everything. I, I Honestly, I have not used it yet, but I know people who have, and they like it. They like it. There was even a blog post from Ancestry Co Corporate on how to use this to enhance and share family photos. I have maybe five from my dad's fire that I think I would be able to help clean it up some. Uh, one of them is a picture of his brother. So Ancestry Corporate, they, said, they stated that by integrating PhotoMind's artificial intelligence-based technology, Ancestry customers will get an even easier way for family historians to digitize old family photo albums by scanning and uploading multiple photographs all at once through the Ancestry mobile app. Like I said, I have not tried it, but I do know people who have. They also stated that almost everyone has a shoebox filled with old family photos and albums that sit on the top shelf in their closet. I was just teaching a class in Mission Viejo. I, I flew to California. And I was trying to convince them that it is important to document where something has been found. And I said, even if the, the place where it is kept or where it's found is in a shoebox in the top of your aunt's closet, write that down. Write that down because that shows the provenance of where this obituary or death certificate came or, or whatever. By going into family search up in the memory section there, that is where I spend a lot of time and also on the family tree. Now I'm going to show you a couple of things that I do. I store my things in the cloud and there are all kinds of things that you can store in the cloud. Personally, I use Dropbox and I I have two gigabytes for free, and I still haven't filled it up yet. I'm a long way from filling it up. I may get there someday, but I'm not there yet. And then what I do, I want you to imagine your genealogy office with the file cabinets and with pulling out the hanging files and then looking down and dropping other, other images and papers and documents into that. That's what I do with Dropbox, because when I look at Dropbox, this goes on for several more pages, and I know you're all reading them, so, but you don't have to worry about it. But every time you see a red star, that is one of my family members, my family line. So I've got Applegate, and I've got Clemens, and I've got Klein, and I've got the Cock and the Cox family plumbing. You can see every time then that I find something relating to that family, then I label it and I put it into Dropbox. So if I look at the Clemens genealogy because that's my maiden name. I click on that to open it up and you can see all kinds of things. Usually what people see first is the woman up here with the cotton candy hair. That was my aunt. I don't know how she did that. But you can see the way that I label them because I have to be able to find them quickly. So I just put in like the very first one in the top left corner, Clemens Ambrose. 
born 1858, died 1949. This is a 1936 letter, page three. And then the next one is the same thing with born 1858, died 1949. It's his death record. All of these are labeled by the last name of whoever it is that I'm putting in here. And I always add the birth and the death date because there are people that have family members that they, all, they were all named the same thing. And we know that drives us crazy. But this way I can tell at a, at a glance that this is a person that I want. I'm cleaning those up because not all of them are like that. So I've got some more work to do on that. That's what I spend my evenings with usually doing that. So if I were to write down my own, like with my dad, it would be Clemens Chester L., born 1912, died 2002. It's his 1944 Navy discharge. That's all it gets on there because all of the other information is in the database that I keep on my computer. My mom, Clemens, Ida Stevens. She did not have a middle name. She was born 1913 and died 1984. And I recorded, I transcribed her journal notes. And then me, Lauritsen, uh, Peggy Clemens Lauritsen. I'm born 1955. And I'm not dead yet, but there's my 1977 wedding photo that I would be able to just quickly put my hands on. That's how I file. Because it's just, we don't want we don't want to file by piles. And I think that some of us maybe file by piles and um, we don't want to do that because if it's a mess on your phone or if it's in a shoebox or in a drawer, it's going to be a mess in Dropbox. It's going to be a mess no matter what. So we kind of have to work at cleaning those up. On my pedigree chart, this is my parents, Chester and Ida Clemens. And my dad came from a big family. And one of his sisters' name was Irene. They always called her Ein. I don't know why, but that's what they called her. So I found some pictures, and I wanted to make sure that they were uploaded, too. So I have Irene. I have Chester Clemens and his siblings. And I have Ein there, too. Okay, you can see that there is an exclamation point below her, her photo there. That just means it has not been labeled yet. Because once we get it in there, we're not done yet. We're not done. So I also have a picture of her and her husband's tombstone. So what I want to do is upload a photo right up there into the middle. And these change on family search. The, the look of it changes. So it's still the same premise. I'm going to upload a photo and I go find it in Dropbox. Because she was a Clemens. But then she was also a Klein, which is right over here. So I, I believe I went ahead and put that into the client genealogy because that's what she would be known as later in life. I opened that up. Yeah, I did put it in client. And there's a picture of her husband, the tombstone that they both have. I just simply click on that and hit open. And it begins to go up to the, up to the memories page. Now you'll see that it says processing. They have to they have to make sure that the photos are good. I used to be one of the people that would okay the photos behind the scenes. And I think there was only one that I had to say no to. And it was a little boy about two or three years old. And he was sitting on the potty and learning how to be potty trained. We all have pictures like that. We've all had kids like that. I had to say no. Because that just might evoke the wrong feelings in somebody who might see that. It's cute for the family, but it might not be cute for anything else. Usually these are processed, sometimes in as little as 20 minutes, usually at least by 24 hours. But again, I'm not done because I have to label that. So when I, that's all complete, and I have labeled it, Leo Klein and Irene I'm Clemens Klein, all I have to do is just hover over her name and her name comes up. All I have to do is hover over her husband's name and his name comes up up there on the right. The thing is, I only uploaded this picture one time, but I can tag people and then it goes onto their page as well. And I have some albums down there below that I can add them to. Now, what really was wonderful is my dad was number five out of 11 children. There he is. Later in life, he looked like Colonel Sanders. 
they look more like Colonel Sanders than Colonel Sanders did. So I uploaded this picture one time. And then as I hovered over each of their faces, then their names began to pop up and recognize those. Because you do want to make sure that, that it's not getting it wrong. So you do want to, you have to make sure. So I did that. And now I only uploaded this one time. But all nine of the children are now tagged. And this photo appears on their page. How cool is that? I didn't have to do it nine times. The other thing is, I believe that this may have been taken at their father's funeral. I think that it may have been because he died in January and grandma died uh, 18 months later in July. They usually were not dressed looking that good. These are people from Appalachia. I mean, they're, they're my hillbilly family. They're not usually looking that good unless they're going to church or going to a funeral. So I'm thinking that this may have been their father's funeral. I think. I don't know. And then, like I said, for each one of them, then on Edna, the one who's right there in the brown, brownish coat, it's also on her page as well. I just love being able to do that. I think it's so cool. Now, I'm kind of embarrassed about something. Because here I am, a professional genealogist, and I did not even have my own parents' death certificates. I, you know, they cost like twenty six fifty, and I thought, what is wrong with me? So during COVID, I went and I got them, and I found out that you know I, I could do something that Ohio just started doing in two thousand fifteen. I needed to upload Dad's um, death certificate to to his uh, page there. So I went and clicked on upload document, went to Chester Clemens right up there at the top in Dropbox and just clicked on that and it went on over. And now it's on his page. So, you know, I, it's just so cool to be able to do this kind of stuff. I don't know if the areas where you are researching has this, but starting in 2015, the governor signed a house bill and it stated that if somebody wants to come in and just take a scan or a photo with their camera of a birth or a death certificate, they're allowed to do it. That is going to save me so much money because all those nine people and their spouses and their children, I mean, that would, that would really add up. So we are able to do that. So in the areas where you are researching, you may want to check and see if your state has done this yet. They might not, but... Hey, you know, they might too. So these are the, the pictures that I took of my mom and dad's death certificates here. One of them is stamped for informational use only. The other one isn't stamped at all. So it's, it's okay. So as I look at this, you know, I'm looking at all of the information. And I looked at my mom's obituary. And I thought, who in the world wrote this obituary? Well, my sister did. And when it came out in the newspaper, my mom said that she was a member of the Church of the Word of Wisdom. Well, what is that? I've never... But you know what? When you're grieving, you're not thinking straight. So with this document, look at what we have here. We've got dad. We've got his dad and his mom. And we've got my sister. Every one of those, I can hover over their name and I could tag them. Because this is dad's death certificate, but these other three are all mentioned in it. So yeah, this would appear on their page too. And that does not bother me. I, I want it to. So it might bother other people because they're not, I don't know, they're not, they're not related. Well, they are related, but I don't know. I just tag everybody that is a family member in there. When I upload that, then I just simply put Chester Lee Clemens 2002 death certificate. That is where that red exclamation point comes. It says, you, you need to give this a name. That's how I do that. And then you can see on the top right where my dad and my grandmother, my grandfather, and my sister are all mentioned in, in this particular document. So that's what I do, but I'm also cleaning up something else. These would just be hanging in Dropbox. And so if I 
had somebody write to me and say, Peggy, could you send me a copy of your mom's death certificate? That's what they would get. But we know how important the documentation is. So what I have done is I just simply go make a, a Word document or a Google Doc or, I mean, whatever you use for a uh, word processor. And up at the top, I just simply put a little box. I insert a box and then I scoot the, the line, the up and down line, clear over to the side because it doesn't need to be in the middle. So with this one, this is the Kentucky Department of Health Certificate of Death for my grandfather. And if I were submitting this for whatever, then I would need to label that document. And that's document number 10 for one that I, I turned in. The one on the right was actually a paper that my mom and dad had. This is a marriage bond. Uh, well, that this, this man, he solemnized the rights of matrimony between John Rowe and Elizabeth Bailey. And my mom and dad had this paper just floating around in their stuff. I also found another image of it on Ancestry. So I put that down up at the top, Kentucky County Marriages, and and the rest of when I found it and the day that I accessed it. I've done the same thing with World War One and Two draft registration cards because that gets a little bit more of a documentation up there. And the same thing with Find a Grave. The thing is that when you are when you are doing it this way, the documentation follows the document. I mean, there's a lot of people who say, well, you know, I write on the back all the documentation. Not everybody turns it over to look at the back. They might. I don't always. But then I also put like a little arrow down there. This is for Low Brown Sr. in the 1820 census. Sometimes what I'll do if it's really little, then I will snip that whole line for Low Brown. And I will, I'll just put it maybe below that or you know, I'll make sure that people can actually read what it states in 1820. When you look at an obituary, I mean, just look for a moment at what all is in there. Mrs. Grace M. Campbell, 72. Now, this is in Niles. But is it Niles? Is it Niles, Ohio? Is it Niles, Michigan? Well, there was a lot of my family that moved to Niles, Ohio. They were coming up in the industrial age. So, yeah, this, I do know where this one is. And I can see at the bottom right that it's, in, it's been written in 1986. She'd been a patient for three weeks. She was born in Olive Hill. And, you know, what you need to do with an obituary is just be sitting there with a family group record, just filling it all out. Because you've got her mother's maiden name, of Hattie Haywood Sparks, and coming to Niles in 1950. Well, that's when my mom and dad came up a member of the Apostolic Bible Church of Niles, her husband, Delmer Camp. I mean, look at all the information just in a tiny, tiny, tiny obituary. And look at all you've got there. We need to make sure that we just harvest everything that we can out of these obituaries. And I would also add that it was expensive to put anybody's obituary in the newspaper. My son died uh, 2009 and it cost us $247 and we put it in twice so that was hefty my friend went to put hers in for her husband about a month ago and it was $800 so what you want to do when you're looking at an obituary this is what the funeral home cleaned out of it but what you want to do is go to the funeral home and see if they have the original obituary that would have lots more information on it that was given by the family. This is the snippet obituary. Actually contact the, the funeral home and you may find that there's a lot more information in there than, than what they had to pay to put in. Now in that box of 575 obituaries and funeral cards, I thought I was going to die. I began looking through them and I thought, you know what, these obituaries, I have never seen any so good as these. I know this man, or I knew him, but they are the best obituaries I have ever seen, the funeral cards, because on the inside, look at the top left, survivors, son and daughter-in-law, daughter and son-in-law, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, brothers and sisters-in-law, sisters and brothers-in-law, you go on down, 
preceded in death by father and mother, wife of 50 years, grandson, brother. I'm, I'm like, I've never seen any this good. Never. I, I think I could learn a lot about how to write a, a funeral card like this. Now, sometimes people became very involved in scrapbooking and creative memories. They don't want to take them all apart. And they said, Peggy, what can I do? I said, you know, you could take a picture of the whole page. And then as you upload that, tag the people that are in those photos. Or you could get right down and either scan or take a picture of the photo. It's on your phone now or it's in your scanner. But don't forget to do something with it. All of these other ones, somebody has gone through and they have labeled these. So there's no wondering who these people are. I think I think it's wonderful that they've done that, but I probably would not take them apart. I would I would take a picture of the whole page and then I would just hone right down onto each individual one. My grandparents, this, this is my dad's parents. I have to tell you about my grandmother. When my dad began doing a lot of genealogy and asking questions, she didn't like that. And what she did is she wrote to every single relative that she had an address for and told him, told each relative, don't you tell him anything. I don't know what they're going to do with all that stuff, but these people are dead. Don't you tell him anything. Little did she know <laughs> that I have been able to track her family, the Collier family, way far back then she ever could. <laughs> so we went to their house one time. And I grew up as an only child. My mom was 42. My sisters were 16, 19, and 21. So I was always squirreling around, getting into trouble. We were at their house. And I asked my dad, I said, Dad, can I take a picture with your camera? He goes, yeah, but if anything happens to it, I'm going to have to holler at you. I'm like, okay, already I'm scared to death. I took this picture. I was four. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I can't believe he let me touch the camera. And then I began to see the picture all over the Internet. And I know who took it. I did. Well, there is a website that is called Edit Images Now. And you can add a watermark to this. So you simply upload that from Dropbox or wherever you've got them stored. And then you tell them, I want the, I want the, the copyright or the watermark down here. And because the couch was brown, then I want yellow. So you can see the text color up there. So that's what appears on there now. Copyrighted Peggy Lauritsen. And I know somebody could probably snip and leave my name right off of that. I, I should put it right across at an angle, but I won't. I mean, it's not just my grandparents. I don't have a problem with, with sharing pictures. Now, back on memories, I want you to look at the left. And you can see that I have added... At this point, this was, I think, back in January, 1,523 pictures. But you're not done. Because look at the, the last four in the top row. They have no title. They don't have that. The rest of them, most of them do. And then I also can put them into albums. So I've got, for my sisters and my mom and dad, they have their own album. But then I've got the Goddard family, the Gerhardt family. You know, I've got uh, family groups together like that. So that's what I do. And where that green plus is, at least at the time that I was doing this, I could just drop and drag and put them right in there. I can drop and drag from Instagram, Facebook, Google Photos. I can get them right up in there. But I'm not done yet. Because I have to do something with them. And not just let them move from one mess and the in the drawers, to another mess on my phone, to another mess in the memory section. You've accomplished nothing by doing that. Now, I, I just think it is so wonderful that we're able to upload audio. When my mother-in-law died, my, grand, my father-in-law just could not take her, her message on the answering machine off of there because then her voice would be gone for good. My son died years ago. And I would give anything to hear his voice again. So what you can do, you can do this on your phone app. This happens to be an Android. 
So up here where the little hamburger is, up here or the waffle, what, whatever people call it. Then you click on that. When you do that, then all of these come up. And I click on Memories. And then I can add a document. I can write a story. I can record audio. I can add a photo. I want my kids and my grandkids. I want them to hear my voice. And I want them to know of the things that just made me so joyful. And the things that made me doggone mad. So I will record like a little two or three minute thing like that and upload it onto my page because we've been given the ability to do that. Now with those memories and family search and the family tree, then there's something that I think is vitally important. I'm going to tell you about my grandmother, my mother's mother. When I was a, a young girl, a um, young teenager, my parents and I would drive to Kentucky every year in October and bring my grandmother back up home. She was older, and my mom was afraid that she would fall while going out to get coal in the coal bucket and everything. So she came back with us, and I let her have my room on the first floor, and I slept upstairs where you could scrape the frost off. It was cold up there. My grandmother had her hair pulled back in a, in a bun. She had one tooth. Her legs went out into a bow. She didn't wear shoes. You know, they, I think she could have walked on glass. And she chewed tobacco. So that's, that's your picture of her. Well, one day I had taken a bath and washed my hair. She always was in there sitting by the fireplace so she could bake her knees. And I got out of there and put on my flannel nightgown and went in. I had hair down to my hips. I was just tossing it back and just drying it. And all of a sudden, she flew out of that chair and knocked me down, grabbed the broom, and started beating the daylights out of me. Now, you know what was about to happen. I sit in my mind, I'm 13, and I'm thinking, what did I say this time? I didn't say anything. I just didn't notice that. I was about to ignite. She had lost a child to fire. She knew. Well, I put that into the story section of her page and tagged uh, other people in it because this is my story about my grandmother. It was my sister's grandmother too, but they, they have different stories about her than I do. So I just simply titled it, She Whooped Me and Saved My Life. And she is tagged in that story, and my mom and dad, and me. And it tells me down there the albums that I've added her to. The neat thing is, we had um, a flood in our basement a year ago. And we were down there cleaning it up. It was one of the biggest messes I've ever seen. And wouldn't you know, I ran across that broom that she beat the daylights out of me with. And I said to my husband, I said, oh, my gosh, look at this. I mean, <laughs> this is so cool. Well, I mean, it might not have been cool at the moment. But I still have the broom that she, she did that. I'm, it's, it's a precious memory. It really is. Now, Steve Rockwood, who is the Family Search CEO, he said, a large percentage of our current site visitors are not benefiting from much of what Family Search has to offer because they don't realize the need to simply sign in with their free account to do so. They are basically arriving in the parking lot, but not coming inside for the main event. So it is vitally important that we do sign in and create an account out here where we do not have the amount of LDS church members that, that you have there. Sometimes people are a little skittish about creating an account. And I just say, you know what? If you, if you sign up for an account, there will be no missionaries that are sent to your door. So, for the new Schwander, he stated that genealogies and family stories and historical accounts and traditions form a bridge between the past and the future and bind generations together in ways that no other keepsake can. A life that is not documented is a life that within a generation or two will largely be lost to memory. What a tragedy this can be in the history of a family. The knowledge of our ancestors shapes us 
and instills within us values that give direction and meaning to our lives. I've had a lot of people in my family die in the last several years. I was born into an old family. Like I said, my mom and dad, they were born in 1912 and 1913. Their parents were all born in the 1880s. So I was born into an old family, and people just give me all their stuff because I know Peggy likes all that stuff. So when my brother-in-law died, I began to look, and I thought, oh, my goodness, there's his Air Force discharge papers. So who's going to get that? He has two boys. Who's going to get that? Well, when I put it up and a family search, they both have it. I, I don't know who gets the original document. Right now, I've got it. But it's preserved forever on family search. Both my husband and I have served missions. And uh, I served on, for the family search wiki. And we were in the Hillcomer pageant. And I want my posterity to know that we served missions. That's an important part of my life. I've earned some awards through the years. I've gone through scouting and wood badge and everything. There's some pens, the piano pen. Actually, each one of my children earned one of those for a piano competition. I wonder how many of you can remember the top pilot program. I bet you you can. I remember the, the big flower pens that one of my aunts wore. And she did not put it in a good place on her blouse. Because when she walked, the thing flopped up and down. But I, I can't forget it. The cameo, my grandmother gave me that. The one who beat me to death. My dad always wore a watch. He always had a pen knife in his, in his pocket. They were with him on the day he died. And I have them here. But in case something happens to my house, I have added those to his, his memories. My dad was in the Navy. And they lived in, in the coal fields of West Virginia. When he got his orders to report, and he was sent to Pearl Harbor. He got there after the bombings and everything. And little did he know that when he came back home, he was in the back of a, a cargo plane. And it was dark. And when it finally landed back here, it was filled, filled with caskets. He never flew again after that. So he sent each of my sisters a picture with Love Dad on it. I have his his World War II draft registration cards, as I do for, well, actually for a lot of people, because we have a military room down in our basement that has photos and documents. I've turned it into a spreadsheet from current conflicts clear back to the French and Indian War. I've got, got them all down there. I have his hat and his uniforms I don't even have a grandchild that would fit in those uniforms now. He was little. His shoe shine kit. Anybody that's in the military, you know how important it is to keep your shoes shined. And then I have his naval records that I was able to get from St. Louis and um, upload these here. People in our family, when somebody dies, they send all their scriptures to us. <laughs> like. We just, we have everybody's scriptures. I mean, <laughs> so that that's good. And what I've done is on a couple of the pages inside where they have notes written or things marked, then I take a picture of that and put that onto their page because obviously that scripture must have meant something to them. I took pictures of my grandparents' houses. And the one on the left, that's where I took the one of my grandparents, but, and I was four years old. Still can't believe my dad let me do that. But we kept looking for this house because my sisters and I, we remembered it being huge. Well, it's not. This is just a, a little house. This, the, the photo on the right, that's the house that my mom's dad built. You know, he, that's the work of his hands right there. We want to take pictures before something happens to them. And this picture, yep, that's little Peggy. That's how old I was when I took that picture. I was born and raised in a log cabin. And just about a, a year and a half ago, my sister called me and she says, Peggy, I see smoke over by the log cabin. Sure enough, it had gone up in, in smoke. It's not there anymore. Thank goodness. 
my mom and my dad had taken these pictures. The house that I live in now, I, I'm glad that we have that. So I can show all of my posterity. This is where your, your great grandmother and your great grandfather had a beautifully happy life. When my mom sat with her mom beside the fireplace, they would put together quilt tops and handwork. Well, I have some of those that did not get destroyed in a fire. I must have brought them home or something. So what I did is I would take a picture like of a great big dresser scarf, and then I would hone in on it so you can see their stitches. The same thing with the quilt. Um, that is machine quilted over there, but the quilt tops, they were put together with aprons and pajamas and neckties. I have all that. I've, I've taken pictures of the whole quilt and then down into the little tiny things that they stitched together as well. Some people may have a problem with sharing recipes. Oh no, that's a family secret. We don't give that out to anybody. And I'm going to tell you, that tradition dies with me. I want my posterity to know how my mom made biscuits, how my dad made minced meat cookies and macaroni dinner. I have put a lot of the recipes up there. I have a bracelet that I was able to buy at K Jewelers because when my son died, I was able to look in his things and find a gift card for $50. And I went to K Jewelers. I said, what can I get? And he said, well, not much. So the letter P there on that bracelet is, it represents me and him because his name was Peter. I have written that story up as well. My husband keeps journal and he, I think he's on volume number 32 now. And yes, he is handwriting them. And if, and if the kids and the grandkids can't figure it out, well, you're going to have to figure it out because he's not changing. He is a master journal writer. One year for Christmas, I made fan charts from Family Search for each of my three living children. It cost 97 cents when I downloaded it onto a flash drive. And then I bought the, the frame for $5 at Walmart. So that's what I gave them for Christmas one year. And I said, now, I don't want you to just put this up on the wall and say, well, that's nice, Mom. No. Let me tell you about these people. Peter Lauritsen brought his family over from Denmark. Two of his children died on the streets of Copenhagen before they got on a boat to go to Hull, England, across England to Liverpool. They came into Castle Garden, and then were, they were able to secure a Thomas Doga wedding until they got to winter quarters, and then they walked. When he arrived in St. Pete Valley, they had been there maybe two months, and... A bull gored him. And it took him about two or three days, but he died. He died. This person up here, this is my dad, grandfather. He was known as the meanest person who has ever lived. When I put together his family story, he had four children. And then I saw where his wife died right after giving birth, but the baby lived. But then baby number three died. He is all of a sudden a young father. There's no social programs. He doesn't even have any family living near him. This is in the hills and hollows of Kentucky. Life dealt him a pretty hard blow. This over here is Caroline Christina, the wife of Peter. As they were going with the handcart companies out to Zampete Valley, she was nursing her baby and was sitting on, I guess what you call the tongue, of the hand cart. And all of a sudden, the baby just died. It wasn't sick. It didn't cough. It just died. These two over here, they were a mother and daughter midwives. And these midwives delivered a good portion of the babies up and down eastern Kentucky. Whether it was hot, whether it was cold, off they went. I have something that we created for my husband, <laughs> just in case, you know, he, I die and, and he's like, I don't know what to do. And I, I said, well, let's, let's just compile this book. 
And he says, well, what about when, when Terry wakes up dead? And I said, no, you don't have to worry because I know how to do everything. So, you know, it just helps when I, will, I won't be there to answer these questions for you. I also went to, on the prowl to garage sales. And I thought, I got, I've got a plan. I'm going to find the ugliest suitcase that I can find. And I found one. It was pink camouflage. And it, it looked like a truck ran over it. So I brought it over to the, to the car wash. And I hosed it out, cleaned it out, scrubbed it out, put it out, let it air in the sunshine. And in that suitcase, which is pretty easy to spot in my house, I have put all of the things that my family and the church will need on the day that we die. They won't have to go scurrying around because I don't care who you are. When somebody dies, as prepared as you think you are, you really aren't. In my husband's family, this is Peter who got gored by the bull. One day, we were at a Lawrence and reunion, and I didn't know anybody. I was trying to learn my, my husband's family, much less all these other people. I didn't know who they were. And I saw this woman come, and she had a great big like tray with saran wrap on it. And I thought, oh, brownie. Okay. Well, then everybody moved away, and I came over, and I saw this picture. I said, oh. Now, tell me who this is. She says, well, this is Peter Lauritsen that came over with the handcart company. I said, do you mind if I take a picture? She goes, no, go right ahead. I had a $35 Vivitar camera from Kmart. So you don't know if those pictures are going to turn out until you get them developed. I took probably on a roll of 36, I probably took 30. <laughs> And then I saw her again last year. She goes, you're the one that took the picture. I said, yeah. She says, let me tell you what happened. She says, about two weeks after that reunion, her son and his family came over. And they were just talking and everything. And her little granddaughter was, she was just a toddler. She was jumping on the couch. And she landed on that picture. And all of a sudden, it goes into a thousand pieces. Because this is card stock. She said, I'm so glad you were able to capture that picture. Because other people have added their photos, then I'm able to look at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven generations for my grand boy. One of the things that really touched me one time, this was in the ensign at the time, and this man was going through looking at pictures, and he, he picked this one up, and he said, well, who is this? And uh, he said, uh, people were saying, well, that's one of your uncles that was shot down in World War II. And he didn't know anything about him. he never heard of him. So he found out that there were still people left in his squadron who were alive. And the thing is that this person looking at the picture looked just like the guy in the picture. He said it was like looking in the mirror. So he began to tell his story because Jerry never married and never had kids. There's nobody to tell his story. And this man, Ryan Kelly, he was going to make sure that his story was told. In my family, we have Carrie, Carrie and I. And then we have Peter, Harmony, Jordan, and Eric. And then we have grandchildren, and they are perfect. Our oldest son died in 2009. Will my grandchildren know their uncle? Will my other children tell them about their uncle Peter? All it takes is three generations for someone to be forgotten. My husband has a big family. I married the best one. And then they all have a number of children, but, you know, some of them have died too. Will my children keep their memory alive and tell them about the reunions that we went to with Uncle David and Uncle Steve and Aunt Gay? All it takes is three generations. There are things that are not allowed. And we that's you're able to find that under any of the family search uh, guidelines. It's, it's easy to find it. 
So there's just some things that they really do not want to put on there. And also, do you have legal rights or has the copyright expired on anything commercial? You have to be careful of those things because you don't want to get you or the church in trouble. There's free cloud storage on FamilySearch for saving your most important family photographs. There's memory keeper links like with family tree memories and importing photos. All of these are there to help us be better genealogists. From my mom's journal, I can remember going back to the old home place where my mother was born. I can remember the house and the farm. I can remember my great-grandfather, Asbury Moore, one time, when I was a very small child. So we go from Peggy to my mom to her mom to her mom and then to Asbury and Catherine. And Asbury was in the Civil War. That is just so amazing when you can follow that line back and see just how many lives were touched. So when my granddaughters, when they touch my hand, they're touching history. And I have to make sure that they know that that history is preserved just for them. So just do it. You know, do it now with a plan and become the ancestor's that you wish you had. <laughs> can, you know, can you all help me out a little bit here? Just become the ancestor that your, your descendants will be so glad for what you've done. And with that, I will turn it back to you.